I do declare a homeschool mama coffee break with my favorite mug. Also my excuse to keep drinking. Okay, so I'm here because I'm gonna chat with Pat Fenner about journaling, but I'm gonna ask you something. Is journaling a practice that you use? And can I suggest that it can be a real powerful tool for you? So I know I've talked to a lot of people about journaling and there are people that love journaling. Clearly, I am one of them because I am literally surrounded with them. Okay, so I, obviously I put together my own journals. I've got one called Grappling with Overwhelm. There's, so I'll go into details later, but I've also happened to write a book. And I realize as I'm going in my book, I even have space, which is not traditional, to write uh, in a response to journal questions because that's how important I think it is. Here I've got an actual journal from my life, coffee stained. I have all sorts of un, non-written, whatever, blank journals that I have ready to go for the Homeschool Mama retreat because I always include a journal for that. And uh, when I die, yes, I must talk about that because my kids and my husband are going to find an entire room downstairs filled with journals. My entire life has been journaled almost entirely. Maybe there's like a three year gap there where it's really tired with the babies. But I have been journaling forever and I think it's a useful self-awareness tool. A self-awareness tool that can be useful to you for these reasons. So if you ever, let's just say maybe, have a challenge with a big emotion in your homeschool where you see yourself being triggered over and over and over and over and over about the same thing, self-awareness tools like journaling help to clarify what's going on. And sometimes by the mere act of you seeing what's going on with you, you actually get a little knowledgeable about how you should approach something or the next step. That's a useful tool. I've, I've got all sorts of different tools. Obviously, you've heard me say many times about the mindfulness tool that we will put in our device a moment in the day that we know is usually a triggering moment and have that remind us to take a breath, which I'm going to do right now. I can't say that word without breathing. If you are speaking to me about breathing, I will take a deep breath. There's something therapeutic about it. When once I thought it was pretty funny, people would say, take a deep breath, just connect with your breath. I'm like, girl, if I wasn't breathing, I wouldn't be alive, so I kinda need to breathe. So what's the big deal about breathing? But it helps us to feel a little more connected to ourselves, it's kind of therapeutic, kind of brings us energy, brings us a little bit of peace. But the other thing is journaling, getting clear on what we understand here. So I'm gonna invite my friend, Pat Fenner, who recently had a podcast episode. So she's got a new podcast and I'd love to hear the details on her new podcast for those People are in transition. Hey, Pat. Hey, hey, hey. Guess what? I have two pairs of glasses. Good. Oops. <laughs> okay, so I've got two pairs of glasses. One is over there. One's on the floor. <laughs> nice to see you. It's good to see you too. We'll just say that my idiosyncrasies are charming, <laughs> or at least I'll tell myself that. <laughs> well, that fits in with your capturing the charmed life now, doesn't it? It keeps you branded. Okay. Am I charming? <laughs> I'm idiosyncratic. I'm drinking from a mug that has chips all over the place, but I really like it. Isn't it pretty? <laughs> you know what? Right now, I'm just eating, drinking a Coke Zero. Like, not even. I am. In the middle of a move, I just got back from uh, walk, a walkthrough for a condo I'm, I'm buying, closing on tomorrow. Huge. And transition. moving in. Yeah, and moving into over the weekend. Wow. So, and not coincidentally, yeah. you just opened or began, began your podcast on transitions. What did you call it? Uh, it's Strong Woman, Strong Woman Bright Future. Um, and it's... Yeah, I actually started it a few months ago, but it's been a one transition after another since I did. So, you know, I think, I don't know if, you know, chicken or egg, whatever, <laughs> came first, but 
I definitely think that God had this. He knew this was coming and he was planning, preparing me for this. So, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the things that you talked about in, was it episode 15? You were talking about journaling. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. And uh, it's so, so, so important. I mean, what you just mentioned, um, you know, recurring things. But I think, and especially when I look back through my homeschooling career, I mean, even now, but through my homeschooling career, with five kids, you know, obviously five different ages, um, I felt like there was always something new coming up, especially yep. with the two older ones. And and for me, journaling helped me kind of process the new stuff, too, because uh, whether it was, you know, the typical curriculum, how do I teach, whatever, and especially once they got into high school, or it was, you know, behavior issues or spiritual issues, faith issues. Like, I felt like there was always something new coming up. And journaling really helped me kind of process the, the new stuff that was coming up. Absolutely. Yeah, that was my first few years sitting in a Starbucks with a journal. And I thought it was like being creative in my creative writing, which I am theoretically. But mostly Perfect. a brain dump of everything that was happening at home and really processing, like really deciding inside myself, is this homeschooling thing a good idea? Or <laughs> like, because right. it doesn't matter. I'm writing real stuff in my journal and nobody's gonna see it. Well, until I die, <laughs> maybe, probably not. But mm -hmm. writing all the stuff and it's just like a brain dump. It helped me process my overwhelm, not coincidence. Right. right. That was obviously my story was everything felt like too much. But mm -hmm. you were talking about that self-awareness, getting a little clear on what really is going on because we have so many demands and there's so many kids with so many things going on for them that you don't even know what's exactly going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's funny too, because sometimes I remember there being times when I would sit down um, you know, with pen on my journal and not know what to write. Just, just because there's, you know, that it was so a flood of like, where do I start? You know, kind of thing. And I eventually transitioned. I don't write in a book anymore. I have a Google doc. That's a lot of pages <laughs> long. Um, I break it up by, by quarter, just like I do with my business stuff, because it just gets too unwieldy after a while. But I've done so much writing online in the, you know, past, what, 10 or 12 years that my fingers, I, I can just think and it just comes, kind of comes out on my fingers, through my fingers. It's kind of weird, but yeah. it really helped. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Even with kids, you know, when mm -hmm. I do creative writing and, you know, I've actually written a fiction novel, which is right over there. I've written a memoir, not published, and I've written the book that, you know, preceded what I'm doing here. And um I did that with kids around me and so I learned how to zone in here and learn how to ignore what was going on around here and mm -hmm. saying but one thing that um who is it Natalie Goldberg from writing down the bones she says I think it's her that says to just write you know so if you have you're not sure what to write then you just write the sky is blue <laughs> or or whatever it just anything i can't think i can't think i can't think just start from and you do that long enough and then you'll be like you know maybe i have something to say maybe this mm -hmm. or maybe you know maybe i'm really upset with or i'm feeling kind of overwhelmed by or you name the thing Mm -hmm. You know what I found too with with journaling is uh, I've read or I heard this somewhere many years ago that um, um, I guess in 2008 to, to kind of preface this 2008 was the housing bubble burst and my husband was a um, contractor and he owned his own construction business and um, had to close his business it was really I mean it was it's not hyperbole to say it was very traumatizing for him. And uh, he kind of went through a depression that honestly, I'm not sure he's even out of anymore yet. Mm -hmm. But um, but he started, you know, getting really, you know, like kind of negative. I mean, understandably and everything, but it, he was getting kind of you know negative that the glass is half full and all that stuff. 
um, very bitter. And I and I had read somewhere that you you're being talking like that and staying in that kind of mode mm. um, literally carves you know tunnels or pathways in your brain like chemically, and it makes it harder for you then to flip. You know, you just can't flip a switch and okay, everything's over and now the sky's blue again and it's pretty. You know, exactly. And yeah, so what I started doing, and I was worried about that because I would talk to his mom, his mom and I, my mother-in-law was more of a mother to me than my mom. She was, I loved her to death. And um, I would kind of just unload, you know, on her and say how concerned I was and, you know, what was going on. And she she was also a writer, like just a hobbyist writer, but she journaled and everything. And she said, just why don't you write about it? Because when you write about it, and and that made a lot of sense to me. You can do a brain dump and then just leave it there. Mm-hmm. And you don't, and at least for me, then I didn't feel like I had to discuss it. I already discussed it, in, you know, <laughs> once in my journal. And while I was doing that, honestly, I was praying about it too. Oh. And and I found that because I didn't want, I didn't want my brain to start, you know, traveling in negative circles and stuff and turning negative. And, but I knew you know, there's still the emotions and reactions and stuff were there and I had to do something with them. You know, you can't just ignore them or deny them and feel like you're going to be a healthy person, you know. Sometimes it helps to clarify what the next step is. And Mm -hmm. so whether that is storyboarding your life, there's this really clever approach of writing everything down in your life, which I'm sure all the homeschool moms out there are thinking, I got time for that. Um, (laughs) as a memoir and it was very useful for me not because i could complain on paper or declare all the horrible things that happened to me or yeah. all the wonderful things that happened to me but really mm-hmm. to look at the themes of what i'm experiencing and to look at the wait what what is the thing that i have told myself about this story or mm-hmm. that i'm experiencing what what's really there because when you look at that you actually discover that oh wait i'm still living that like i experienced Mm -hmm. and now i'm experiencing it at 48 coincidence i think not and (laughs) and you talk about the i forget how you said it but like creating those what i think of as neural pathways so Mm -hmm. we experience it in a certain way and we all experience things differently you can see this with if you have siblings obviously have kids but if you have more than one child, you'll see that they engage this thing very differently, whatever the scenario is. And so we have natural tendencies towards certain approaches, but just because we have a natural tendency there doesn't mean that's the only way to think about the thing. Right. You can't know how to choose to think about the thing if you don't know what you already think about the thing. So that's the, the goal, I think, of journaling. And there's many reasons for it but that one for me has been truly healing and Mm -hmm. therapy (laughs) definitely definitely you know there's a i have an episode coming up um i've got my notes right here on five five activities five you know action things that you can do to get through the day when there's so much change and you're just overwhelmed and everything and one of them is is journaling um the other one you mentioned earlier was the breathing Mm-hmm. And I, I I I heard this neat uh, this little snippet to what's coming up in the episode, but I heard this neat visualization thing too while you're doing breathing is that you you draw an, a a box with your you know in your in your mind, and you go across and you breathe in for four seconds or five seconds however long you want to do it, then do the line down and hold it with, while you're holding it, and then go across and exhale. And then draw up and hold the exhale. And that last thing, I thought, well, how do you do that? That, I mean, (laughs) I was very skeptical skeptical about it when I first heard. But it's it's very calming and centering to hold and exhale. Just that concept never had occurred to me before. Mind, yeah, like breathing for, Mm -hmm. breathing in, holding, exhaling, holding, holding. Right, and then breathing in. Mm -hmm. So it feels good to me now, but I remember talking about breathing way back and thinking, it's just hokey. Like, we have to breathe. I've taken physiology. I'm a nurse. We have to breathe. 
so we can live. But actually, the, it can be very therapeutic. And if anybody has felt anxious, um, you tend to hyperventilate and you breathe and breathe and breathe really fast. And turns out that just turns up the anxiety. And what someone will say is to breathe into a paper bag. I don't know if that's a thing anymore, but they do yeah. help you to slow down your breathing by being intentional. Breathe with you and breathe like maybe box breathing like that. And it helps mm -hmm. things down. But what I often suggest is when you want to practice the pause, if you're reactive with your kids and you have a moment where you're like, oh man, it's like Groundhog Day. I keep reacting to the same thing over and over and over. And it's just instant reaction. Mm -hmm. That's the hardest point to actually train yourself to not immediately go into it. So first of all, I just want to acknowledge that that is the hardest element of dealing with your reactivity is practicing a pause. Mm -hmm. All you need to do is take a breath. And you're not going to figure out what you need to do. You're not going to hit it right or do it right the first time or maybe the 30th time. But if you aim for the just breathe, maybe do three, four beat box breaths or do that box breath thing three times, then... Mm -hmm. Be practicing the pause so that you can decide how you're going to react rather than just react. That is so important for us to, to realize that we get we get to decide how to react. Yeah, and that that has been like this big aha thing for me because I grew up in a family where there was a lot of anger. There was a lot of reactionary anger too. It was you know, um, and it just my I mean my dad would just explode like you know and we didn't always sometimes we saw it coming but we didn't always know it was coming but we always knew that was what you did we knew air quotes that was what you did when you got angry right you yell you explode so i had two little kids at home when they were lit you know one of the first two little ones and that's what I, that's my fuse went off when i got angry right and of course when you have two little ones it's not that you're always getting angry but you're frustrated a lot not only are they squabbling? But it's a lot of new, right? And a lot of new behaviors as a young, new young mom. Yes. And, so, and you don't always know how to handle it. Um, but then learning, you know, many years later about that, yes, while you may have experienced things and developed patterns from your childhood, you, you get to decide as an adult now. You don't have to do that just because that's how you grew up. And somebody asked me this morning, well, how did you do that? How did you figure that out? Well, first of all, I didn't. Um, I have 100%. Okay, that, that's true. And also, mm -hmm. slowly, and one million lessons along the way. That it's been an effort every, every step, you know, to figure out. Mm -hmm to engage in that correctly, but the, you have to build self-awareness somehow, some way. So if it's journaling, if it's talking to someone, or if it's breathing, or I've said this so many times, but putting um, a reminder in your phone or your device to tell you to breathe and to tell you to stop and to ask yourself, especially the worst part of the day, the, day, the part of the day that you're likely to react, to ask yourself, like, what are you feeling right now? And so when did that feeling first begin for you today? What was the scenario? What was your thought in that scenario? And what's the story you're telling yourself? I love that prompt. What's the story you're telling yourself? Because even if you don't feel like you're a writer or a storyteller or, or whatever, which surprisingly more, most of us are, we just don't consider ourselves that. Uh, because uh, there was another episode where I talked about um, being becoming aware of the stories we tell ourselves all day because they, you know, if you come from, for an example, you know, an abusive family, the stories you might be telling yourself could be something like, gee, um, well, that, you know, things never work out for me or, well, it figures out, you know, figures that that didn't work or that, you know, I'm just a loser. Like, and you might not say these out loud. Mm hmm but if you had to stop yourself and ask yourself, what are you thinking right now? They could very well be going through your head like that. Absolutely. And, and you mm -hmm. don't there or you even, it's easy to put on masks with other people. Okay. Cause mm -hmm. we're all familiar with that concept, 
but we're not always aware that we're putting on masks for ourselves, that we're telling ourselves, well, I wouldn't say that to myself. Meanwhile, yes, you wake up in an existential crisis at three in the morning, I don't know, three days before you <laughs> or something, or there's a lot in these the last few years actually <laughs> to feel especially pressured. And we all have moments, we all have moments that are like that, that are dark, mm -hmm. are, you wake up in the morning, the sun is bright, and you're like, what was I thinking? I'm fine, I'm fine, everything's good, God is good, or whatever words we tell ourselves to say mm -hmm. no. But in some ways, we're creating a mask, we're, we're allowing ourselves to have a mask to ourselves, rather than acknowledge, mm -hmm. oh, whoa, what was that existential crisis thing going on there? Like, what was the source of that? Where did I first experience that? Mm -hmm. what do I what was a story that I created around that yeah. and sometimes too you mentioned um a little bit ago I, I don't remember the context but you know as believers that happens a lot that we we want to kind of sugarcoat things because we feel like at least I did I'll, I'll just speak from my experience I always felt like when I was having a crisis you know or when I was having a problem or you know reacting poorly or whatever anything that could be construed as negative okay I felt like it reflected that I didn't have uh, you know that my faith wasn't strong enough that I wasn't praying enough that I wasn't a good enough Christian that you know some something spiritual and those are those are core values for me my faith is is very central to who I am. And so for me to be saying those things to myself, I would never say them to a friend ever. You know, you're just worried because you don't, you don't pray enough. What? You know, or you don't have a relation. You don't really have a relationship with the Lord because you wouldn't be so worried if you did. I would never say that to a person, but maybe sure. Yeah, whatever. So I know that we're in a mixed audience here. So not everybody has the right. same faith. Um, right and this is true from my experience, is that I had a moment in a passport office with a book called Watch, or, uh, The Normal Christian Life by Watchman Nee. I don't know why it's titled that. It doesn't reflect the contents. But I had a moment that I realized that everything that I was doing up until that point was to actually gain everyone around me all their favor and gain God's mm -hmm. And then I, but if you really square that with what you're told, what the message really is, that is not the message that and and but for me i didn't actually recognize that if if what god says to be true about me then i don't need to gain god's favor so mm -hmm. food for thought i know that not everyone's coming from the same perspective but i do know right. that we are striving towards something and there's a story we're telling about ourselves or telling ourselves about that something and we have mm -hmm. to how are you going to look at it? You're going to stop Well, and ask what's going on in here. Right. And you and I are recovering people pleasers. So. <laughs> so. Yeah. Good. good. The queen of unmakers, I say. <laughs> Somebody yesterday was like, amen. I'm like, oh, girl, that is that you're speaking my language. Yeah. Enneagram too. I mean, but I think yeah. we, of that because we are all communal and we all mm -hmm. want a relationship that's normal and we all have some element of us that is like well we want to make sure that the people around us whoever we deem valuable is also seeing us as valuable mm -hmm. yeah. all some element of it we're just really really good at it yeah so you have questions on your podcast would you share a few of those with me or do you have those accessible? What, I'm sorry, what was the first part of that? Um, I think it was episode 15. You had some really great journaling questions that we could actually consider in our journals. Oh yeah, let's see. Yeah, it was, uh, inter it was an interesting episode because uh, earlier in this year, I'm just gonna pull them up real quick while I'm talking. Uh, I had taken, uh, uh, book coaching training. I'm a, I'm a certified uh, author coach with Hope Writers, and they used a um, a generalized coaching program. I can't remember who it was from, um, and then just tailored it to 
you know, specifically to help authors who are getting stuck and you know stuff like that. So there was a lot of general training, which was really, really helpful. Um, and actually, you know, it's just it's just so funny how I don't know the universe, God, whatever you want to call it, um, worked things out because it's helped that that training helped me so much in this podcast that I'm yeah. doing now. It's just it's really just incredible. Mm. So. So these journal prompts, um, let's see, I found that there's four areas uh, that we, when we're going through transitions, because I, that's what the, that's what the podcast deals with. Uh, and of course, we're dead if we're not going through transition, right? Change, change is the one thing that doesn't change in life, right? So I found that there's usually four areas that we need to, to consider when we're in transition. It's practical action. Um, emotional awareness, and that was what you were talking about earlier, you know, becoming aware, self-aware. Um, relational affects, how what we're doing and feeling and going through affects our relations, relationships around us. And then forward-thinking attitudes, what's going on in our head. Yeah. And, um, and so I think those are all things that we need to think about. You know, even if you feel like your life's kind of rolling along smoothly right now and there's no transitions or changes coming up, it's important to think about those areas now because there will when be. you, yeah, <laughs> that's right. There will be. Just stay tuned tomorrow, you know. So I just I just listed a couple of prompts um, in each area. Let's see. Um, well, one of them, the emotional awareness, because you you always emphasize, and I really love um, Teresa how you. Uh, really emphasize to people how important it is to know what's going on for yourself inside your own psyche and your mind and your heart. Because um, for years I didn't as a, you know, as a two, as a people pleaser, but also, you know, as a mom, I think a lot of us are, we're always serving others. Right. And we don't think about ourselves. And, and, you know, I, I grew up Catholic where it, I was, I was told you don't like not only it has, it's an intentional thing. Don't think about yourself, you know, but you can't pour from an empty pitcher. You, you have to take care of yourself at some point. So, yeah. you know, some of the, as human as your kids are, you have needs, but, you know, maybe not the same, hopefully not the same as when you're a child. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's good. It's good for your kids to see that you have needs too. Like we, we do them a disservice by by making them think that we've got our act together, either as moms or as adults. It depends. Some people do one way, one the other, because uh, eventually they'll be adults, and they'll realize, man, you lied to me all these years because I don't have it together. They were adults when they figured out my act was not together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So a couple of the questions that I put in, on this um, on this. Uh, prop thing was what emotion it what emotion or emotions because it's often more than one is this transition stirring up in you right now and just stop and do an emotional assessment yeah. um, what memories of past events are connected to or with those emotions because sometimes uh, you know if, if fear for example is an emotion that you're feeling right now you may be afraid from something that happened when you were a child. Maybe you were, um, you know, with, uh, abandoned or, you know, uh, abused or whatever, but that's where the, the, the root of that emotion might be. And then the thir third question I think is really where you stop and think, because the third question I have is what is the connection between those events? The one you're right now going through and the one that is kind of at the root of that mm. Um, and then I encourage you to describe the similarities and describe the differences, because I think sometimes we tap into a different event, even from what's going on right now. Yeah. And we may not realize it, mm -hmm. um, but that's where the thought while you're journaling comes in. Yeah. If you haven't rendered it, it's still there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Remarkable how I can be a 48 year old, but I can go back to my eight year old self. And we I say that because I know it's true. And I have conversations with all sorts of people across the walks of life, not all homeschool moms. And I ref 
I'm no longer surprised by people's stories because whatever your story is or whatever the theme of your story is, that might not have anything to do with homeschooling per se. Right. Everybody else has got something like that. They're experiencing something like that too. So mm -hmm. the first step as I, did I say it here or did I say it this morning? But the first step is acknowledging that you're a human being. This is real. There's a lot going on in here. There's amazing mm -hmm. here. And there's some amazing things in here that have been protecting you for a long time that are not helpful anymore. They're no longer helpful. And the only way you're really going to get this is to explore and go into mm -hmm. this, which is not fun, but turns out it's, it is what it is. Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah, yeah, a while ago. I'm sorry? No, uh, you can bring your eight-year-old self into your present day, or you can figure out how to be with that eight-year-old self and say, okay, it's time. You you need to be loved and nurtured and heard. Mm -hmm. and, and now I need to be 48. Right, right. Yeah, listen, I'm sick. 48. I'm sick. <laughs> I'm 61 and I can't believe my eight-year-old child sometimes is still like, yeah. why are you still here? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What um, gonna, yeah. What were you going to say? Um, I'm trying to think that the, um, oh yeah. I remember I was in counseling a couple of years ago. Um, I was just kind of at a crossroads in my personal life for, and had to make some really difficult decisions and I was st stuck at something. And my counselor said, you know, like, help me work through the pros and the cons and, you know, what, what, what do I imagine would be the result of making this decision either way and all that stuff. And I was still really, I realized the decision I needed to make, but I was still holding on, you know, for some reason. Yeah. And she said, what, what story, what do you, what story have you heard or, or grew up with about this decision that's, that's giving you, you know, and, I, and, it, and it wasn't a question that, she expected me to answer off the cuff. You know, that was definitely go home and think about it. <laughs> Come back and let's talk. And, you know, it required a lot of thought. But then her follow-up question to, in our discussion was, is that conversation still working for you? I mean, it, it's not a question of, um, you know, like even sin or not sin or healthy or not healthy. It's It's just I wasn't even aware of, the conversation that had been going on in my head from what I'd heard from when I was little mm -hmm. and realized, no, that's not, it's not working. That's, that doesn't relate. That doesn't apply. That's not healthy for me to be thinking of that conversation in this decision. It's not yeah. a thing. Except that it's there still until you render mm -hmm. it and you can't, right. you don't know what's there. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful mm -hmm. conversation. At. So your your journaling questions are geared towards transition, um, and I have journaling questions that are helping you to uncover what overwhelmed thing you're really experiencing, because overwhelm could be so many things. But also a discussion on de-schooling, because I think that brings freedom when you de-school, but building boundaries in your life, which sometimes directly impacts your relationships, also um, impacts how you show up in relationships, and it builds your identity, your sense of self, separate from your your homeschool mom role. So, and and boundaries help you to deal with change too. I, I have an episode on that because when we're when we're trying to transition to become, you know, maybe we have to redefine ourselves. I mean, maybe it's a major thing, and what are we still going to allow? others to either expect or ask of us what are we willing to give you know i had a, a friend of mine one time who said you know boundaries that just seems like such a harsh thing to to keep people out and i said it's quite the opposite actually because it's a win-win for both you and the other person you know what you're willing to say yes to and when you say yes to it it's guilt-free kind of you know because you know you've thought it through yes i'm willing to do this and you, you can handle it but when you don't have the boundaries and you say yes, very often you're resentful or you can't follow through. I mean, and that certainly doesn't help the, the relationship situation when you decide, oh, well, maybe I shouldn't have said yes. Because, you know, now that we're in the middle of it, this is a feeling good. So, you know, I think boundaries are really the healthiest thing you can do. and can help you, you know, navigate today or navigate whatever changes you have. 
Yeah, and that word right there, so nebulous, boundaries. Uh, that's immediately mm -hmm. done group coaching on boundaries. Let's establish what that actually even means because it really does mean different things to different people. It's just one of those overused words. And when you're speaking in this context, when it comes to what you're gonna do for other people, to me, it's not so much I don't want to do something, although it could be, and that's fair enough. Mm -hmm. It's more like, who are you? And is this truly a reflection of who you are and what you should be doing? And so, you know, I remember way back in the day when people would ask me to do children's church. And I was like, can I just like be straight up and say, don't really like kids. And I'm <laughs> listening to this is going to be like, wait, what? You're a homeschool mom. No, I like my, I like everybody's kids. I don't dislike your kids either, but I don't like, like, so much that I want to be hanging out doing these, what I perceived as not so fun activities, coloring random stuff. I'm like, nah, that's not my thing. And it was understood as, well, then you're not investing your time the way that we need you to. But for me, I'm just like, girl, this ain't my thing. This is not my place. Help me, whoever I am, fully express who I am. I'll do my best effort if I'm in a thing that I'm really focused on or that I'm really naturally good at an extension of who I really am. Right. Yeah. And you know, if you're not certain that you are or were or whatever, but sometimes people aren't certain, well, is that something I would like or not? But, and that's another thing that journaling really can help with. I mean, it, it's helpful to just sit down or have a page dedicated to, that you, you know, go back to once in a while to write down the things you enjoy doing. Mm -hmm. You know, you clearly didn't enjoy being with kids doing random coloring sheets. I don't blame you. Um, you know, people's children. Yeah. Could you say that again? I, I didn't. I didn't hear that. I always said that I wanted ten kids. Okay, I don't know what I was thinking, but I always wanted the kids. I just didn't want to be in children's church with them. <laughs> yeah. But see, but then that would be something you might write down on that sheet. You know, I love kids, but not. But children's church is not my wheelhouse. You know. And, and to have an idea of what your likes and dislikes are and to have them on paper really can make, you know, when, you're, when you have a request like that, can make your decision easier because you can say, well, let me think about that. Then go, go to your journal, pull out that page. Let's see, well, it means that I would be doing this and this, which I don't like, and okay. this, oh, this I do like. You know, like you can really, it gives you a checklist that you can use very practically speaking to make decisions. Yeah, and be very clear on what you can, like whoever you are, whatever you really do love doing, you're gonna do best mm -hmm. at the most. So the world wants that, the world wants that. You do not want me to teach your kids calculus. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for chatting with me today. So where do I find your journaling? Everybody. Well. Uh, if you go to patfenner.me, you'll see the tab for the podcasts. Okay. And uh, if you look at uh, 15, I think there's a, the, one of the episodes called Journaling Prompts. Uh, and if you, you click on that, that's, it'll, it'll be on there. And that's also the, you, you can listen to that episode of the podcast. You can see the show notes and everything right there. It's all, all in one place. Thanks for being here, Pat. I really appreciate it. Digging deep into oh. the writing world. <laughs> Thank you. To, uh, Teresa, I love spending time with you anytime. This was a pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. We'll talk All right. To you. Okay. Yeah. Take care.